this together. And thank you all the participants for um, being involved this morning, and it should be a great event. Very good, very good. Uh, well, as in the past, uh, one of the things that I will do is, is have a handout, and I don't want to spend my time talking and, and try to tell you what's going on in the market. This purpose of this is to listen and to hear what your perspectives are. And so as we go through, um, just a couple of quick reminders. Once again, I mentioned if you're able to turn on your camera, I think that's helpful. It facilitates the interaction and the discussion. Uh, number two is um, that uh, if, you, if you have something to say or you want to speak, you can raise your hand. There's actually a way to do that virtually. We'll raise your hand button in Zoom. But it also works really well if you just raise your hand, because I can see everybody's picture here. And so that, that works well for me. Um, if you are, you know, phone only or something where you don't have a camera access and you got something, please go ahead and jump in. Uh, we want to do that. But when you're not speaking, it's helpful to make sure you keep your, your mute on. And uh, so I think those are the kind of the organizational details. So let me share my screen here and start by talking about the handout that I sent out to everybody and just kind of give a quick little review of some of the current situation that we're in. Um, so. The, everyone should be able to see my screen, I hope, and what you can see here is um, economic measures for the local market, and these are the most stunning pictures that I think we've um, ever <coughs> seen in, in terms of, of things that are happening, the, the drops and the downturns we have. I, I put the, so for instance, this first graph is total employment which is the jobs numbers based on based on employer or the workplace where people work. And I indexed it to the beginning of 2008, which is right when employment peaked, just as we began to go into the Great Recession. And so every other number is relative to this 100 point. And you can see here that nationwide employment dropped from a level of 100, the red line here down to about 94, meaning that there was a 6% decline in employment over the two years after the start of the Great Recession, which had caused, started in the downturn later and fell even worse, down about 7.5% uh, to the bottom where we had. We only grew back in Wichita, back to employment levels right at the beginning of 2020, equal to where we were 12 years ago. Our total jobs only just caught up nationwide. We got to a place where we were about 10% higher than we were at the beginning of the Great Recession. But then when the shutdowns happened, we had really <coughs> and severe closures. And the one kind of economic phenomenon that I want to mention here, and it's true with the realtor data that's, that, that's released by NAR, whenever you see seasonally adjusted data like this and you make comparisons, um, you'll see reports about how you know the largest gains in history in terms of the seasonally adjusted basis, you know, between say June and July and things like that. But but that's misleading because it's only due to this really really steady growth. Even after these really sharp increases in employment that we've seen, the United States we're still just barely above the employment levels that we were 12 years ago. And so the, the jobs have been severely impacted uh, by the shutdowns. And we get a similar picture with unemployment rates. Wichita, much more severe, as is typically the case in the US as a whole in terms of unemployment rates. And we are still at an unemployment rate, Wichita and the US, that is higher than we were at the depths following the Great Recession. Okay? Now, some of the impact of that has been mitigated by all of the government relief programs, the additional unemployment benefits, uh, the PPP loans, other things, the stimulus checks. Some of those things have mitigated how much those high levels of, 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 of employment and unemployment stress have rippled through the economy. And so we will see how this continues going forward. But this is the picture that we're in right now that I wanted to make sure you all kind of have before you as we think about our discussion. Um, you all know mortgage rates and uh, total home sales. This is just the total sales in the South Central Kansas MLS on the bottom graph. 
Uh, the only thing I wanted to mention here is that the green line on this chart is the Mortgage Bankers Association's forecast for the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. And as of last couple of weeks, they're still at forecasting rates to stay below 3.5% through the end of 2021. So whether they're right or wrong, that's what their forecast is. Um, I also like to look at balance in the market. And again, I don't want to pre, you know, change your thoughts and your discussion. I want to see what you all have to say about it. Uh, but a couple of points that I know here about month supply. Once again, this is active listings divided by the average case of sales over the past 12 months. And one thing that was different in Kansas than it was nationwide with the shutdowns is because real estate was deemed an essential service, we did not see a sudden spike in month supply and in inventory with the shutdowns. We continue to be able to do activity. It doesn't mean we were unaffected, but we weren't artificially constrained by government fiat to tell us that we couldn't do transactions, couldn't do things. And so you'll notice that that spike in month supply that happened here um, in, in, during the shutdown nationwide did not happen here in Wichita or indeed anywhere across the state. Um, and then I also, you know, I've begun to break down month supply by price range. And so here this is based on list price. Uh, a lot of fans here because of, you know, those upper end of the market tends to have much higher month supply. But you'll notice here, and again, I really like your perspective on this. We've seen the month supply for, for homes priced above 400000 has has really declined to where now it's more in what we might call a balanced market between four and six months supply. But just because we say that's our statistical measure doesn't mean that's how buyers and sellers are behaving. And that's the discussion that I want us to have here to see how our buyers responding, how our sellers responding. Uh, the last page of graphs here I have is on uh, home price appreciation and permitting activity in the Wichita area. Uh, for home price appreciation here, um, the second quarter figures from the Federal Housing Finance Agency were released earlier this week, and they show that year over year, during the second quarter, all during the shutdown, home prices in the Wichita area increased on average about 5% compared to the second quarter the prior year. Now again, this is based off of homes uh, with mortgages that are sold to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So there are some segments of the market that aren't well captured in this. And uh, no home is the average home. So I'd really like to hear your perspectives on, on what's going on um, in different segments of the market. Um, and finally, permitting activity. Um, while we've had some anecdotal things about increased activity in, in terms of, of uh, new home construction and, and construction activity, we're not seeing it quite yet in terms of a significant uptick here. And so again, I'll be interested in hearing your thoughts and perceptions about where we are as we look forward into the coming year. So any questions about these graphs before I jump in? Like I said, I don't want to take much time on them. I, I just wanted to have some background that if you care to refer to them, I can bring them back up if we ever need to in our discussion. So any thoughts or comments or questions? Seeing none, I will jump in to the first interactive element that I have here. And like I did last year, um, I have uh, set up a poll under Poll Everywhere and this is my way of, of facilitating a discussion. And so the way you participate is you go to the website pollev.com, P-O-L-L-E-V.com slash W-S-U real estate, all one word. And when you get to that website, you will see this question in front of you and you can input in one or two words, um, the current Wichita real estate market. What, what's, what's the status of the market? When people ask you, hey, how's the market doing? What do you say to them? What are the first words out of your mouth? If you want to use your phone and text it in, you can, can send a text message to 37607 and text the word WSU real estate. It should come back to 
helping you with a, you are now connected to WSU Real Estate, and then your replies will be to whatever question is up on the screen here. And so we're getting some responses. I think six people have replied so far. Words we've got, inventory, hot, low, crazy, scary. And for those of you who've never worked with these word clouds before, I think they're really fun. Um, it's a great way to facilitate some discussion. What it does is, is the more frequently people use the same word, the bigger the word appears in the word cloud. And so certainly we've got people saying hot and crazy. Um, I'm guessing that the low and the inventory went together. The low inventory, thriving, nuts. I like that word, that's, that's a good word. Um, fierce. So you can feel free to keep adding the responses. I actually left it a little bit open so you could respond more than once if you wanted to, and you can see how you can remove your response. <laughs> Um, but let me to go then and, and, and try and elicit, elicit some, some thoughts on here. So uh, I, I said I kind of liked the word nuts. Does anybody want to admit to the word nuts and what you were thinking about with that? So who said nuts? Raise your hand or shirt. Or, or, uh, so go ahead, Dwin, unmute and, and tell us what you were thinking with that. That's all right. It's all right. There we go. Are you there? We are. Okay. I think nuts because it just is, it's, it, it's nutty the way you, you, you can't, it's, we used to be able to squirrel away things. We can't do that now. Squirrel away listings or squirrel away? Like, well, you know, you can kind of squirrel away and think, well, we can put that outside and we can come back to it if we decide that we want to change ah, it. We ah. don't do that anyway, anymore. So if a buyer if a buyer doesn't make a decision now, it, immediately the decision is made. <laughs> you walk in that house and if you like it, you better you better write an offer. It used to be, oh, you can have a day to think about it, but it's that's just not possible. I mean, I just I mean, I see you nodding your head say, that. You know, um, three out of three houses that the people saw last night on the internet, they wanted to see today, and already one of them was gone when she went to set it up. So. I, I just felt like you could kind of squirrel it away and say, well, we, we can come back to that one if you like it in a day or so, and we can't do that right now. Patty, you are nodding your head. Do you want to add anything to that? Remember to unmute. There you go. Yes, I'm here. Um, yeah, I the word I put was fierce, and, and that's kind of along the same lines as what Dwayne was saying, but it... This market is really not for the weak at heart. I mean, you, you have got to be really tough skinned right now to be in this market, whether you're an agent or you're a buyer. Um, it, it, it's hard out there and it's discouraging and um, the, the kinds of interactions we're, we're having with people is amazing. I mean, I, I received a call from another agent's buyer at a different company asking if we could help her agent find her a house. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's kind of interesting uh, how desperate everyone is. <laughs> okay. Patty, do you, Patty, do you think they, they did that because they thought if you would know something coming up and they can get into it first? Um, I, I think that's what they may be thought they they just felt like their agent needed help because everything was selling and i just said you know that's just the way it is right now <laughs> um it's that way everywhere so i don't know if she felt like her agent wasn't doing a good job or um but i just confirmed with her that that's the experience everybody's having so uh leslie i saw your head nodding when when uh, nancy uh, when uh <laughs> Gwen was speaking as well. So what, what were your thoughts? Well, when when COVID was first announced, you know, and came on the scene, it was kind of nuts. We were like, are we going to still work? How's everything going to go down? And then what was crazy about it is the calls just continued to come in and it was almost unprecedented, like how many phone calls we were getting of people that were still wanting to buy houses, not necessarily list, but buy. And it was 
it's just been crazy. They were actually excited when all the toilet paper uh, things became short supply because they're like, okay, we're gonna go out and look for a house while these rest of these people are looking for toilet paper. And we've actually lost multiple buyers temporarily because they're like, we just don't wanna participate in this. So they were hot and heavy and we were making offers, making offers, not getting offers accepted. And then they're just like, we're gonna wait until fall. And I said, well, you know how many people I've heard that from? I mean, I don't know, you're gonna be in the same buyer pool and fall again. So it's just been kind of wild to see how this is playing out. No, not really. We've had a lot of um, people that have been able to work from home, some engineers, uh, teachers that weren't back at school. So, you know, especially in like April and May, it gave them more time to be out looking. Um, no, we really haven't heard anybody that's been concerned about layoffs. And maybe that's just the clientele that we're dealing with, but I haven't heard it. Stacy, I'm sorry, Sandy, what about you in terms of uh, what you've seen? Are there different segments of the market where it's been crazier or less crazy? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, those price points that are obviously the hot one, um, I would totally agree 100%. Our buyers are frustrated. They're, they're making offers well above list price and still not getting it, writing a perfect offer in it, every, any other market and not getting a chance at um, a contract. But that's in that price point, the magic price points, you know, that 150 to 200, 225, those are unbelievable. You know, you can just be prepared if you've got a listing in that market to just kind of take a day or two off and know that you're gonna just deal with multiple offers. That's all you've got. <laughs> that's all you've got the time to do on that particular day. I had one in Bel Air that was 122.5, and I literally, you know, 13 offers in the first eight hours that it was on the market. And that's all I got done was just sorting and building a database and trying to help sellers get the picture. But the extreme opposite, I think, is they're also in those upper ends where we are we are sitting on those homes to some degree. Um, it's not as bad as it was, I don't think, but definitely in the threes and fours, those are not flying off the shelf. So, Matt, I see you've got your hand raised, and then Cindy, I wanted to come back to you, maybe ask about some of the upper end of the market and see if you're seeing differences now from where we were maybe a year ago. So, Matt, go ahead. Well, I just kind of wanted to pose a question that would be a year uh, graphs and discussions that you think about, um, because my perception has been uh, throughout this whole deal that with the scary unemployment numbers, I keep waiting uh, for people to stop spending money like it's never going to run out, but that doesn't seem to be happening. Um, because what you said, uh, you know, buyers continue to act like they're not afraid of unemployment. And so I say, I didn't know if you had any kind of numbers that indicated where um, on the income levels these jobs that are being lost are. It would seem to me, with, you know, with restaurants and a lot of service sort of staff, a lot of people that I would assume would be more um, mm -hmm. sort of tenant occupied uh, side of things. And so I, I, I think that that would be reasonable as to why we're not seeing um, buyers as concerned about their job because the people who are typically going to be home buyers are the ones that are capable of working from home and, and doing that sort of thing. So I, I don't know if you have any numbers or have you seen anything that indicates that. Um, I, I don't have anything specifically to that, and it's a great question, and it's something actually that's come up in some of our other roundtables as, you know, to what extent is it that the people who are um, most affected by the shutdowns and the layoffs are people who are less likely to be in the home buying market to begin with. Um, there is still the question of, you know, as the recession goes forward and continues, it ripples through an economy and has impact. We certainly in Wichita have a lot of people who are in a home buying pool, especially in the aviation manufacturing, that, that are very heavily affected. So 
Um, it's a question actually that, I, that I'm planning on taking to Jeremy Hill at the Center for Economic Development and Business Research and see if he has some breakdowns to be able to, to give some feedback in terms of who's being affected by the unemployment. Um, so, Cindy, do you want to share with us anything? I see you're connecting to uh, audio, so you may be having some problems. Let me go back up to John McKenzie while you're getting settled in there, Cindy. Uh, John, you, know, you see everything that's going on in your office. Do you see anything particularly different across different segments of the market uh, with how you see this? I think probably the most visible um, shakeup that I'm seeing in the marketplace is this dire need for the consumer to get out of the house. Um, when I say the consumer, I'm also referring to the Asian population as well. I think there's a, there's a series of frustration out there. Um, being cooped up, and we're not used to being a cooped up animal, uh, has, has caused some, some concerns and attitude and the way they're dealing with uh, some of the stresses that we're dealing with. Everybody pointed out that multiple offer situation is just absolutely uh, incredible, seeing, uh, seeing people miss out on offers that are five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars over asking price. So I, I think we're managing attitudes more than anything else uh, right now, both on the buyer and seller side and in the agent population side. Um, I'm concerned going forward because if we continue to, to keep our people cooped up like this, it's it's gonna have a dramatic effect long term. Very good. Very good. Cindy, so uh, what, what are you seeing in the upper end of the market? I don't mean to pigeonhole you that way, but, but I think we respect that that, uh, uh, that that you have a good sense of that segment. I think the, the market overall in the upper end up to a million dollars is pretty good. Over a million, it's pretty slow, but it always has been and it always probably will be as long as I'm in the market. But honestly, I, I, one of the things I just want to get in here is how absolutely wonderful the realtors are treating each other right now. I feel like there is a tremendous sense of gratitude uh, among all the agents that we are able to continue to work. And we're just uh, thrilled to see such incredible professionalism within our industry. But as far as uh, the upper market, we've sold some. We have plenty for sale. Uh, I, I think people are trying to decide if they're gonna have to stay home, which home they wanna be in. So I think a lot of it is I can't travel. I can't really spend a lot of money on wine and dining. If I'm gonna stay home, I'm gonna stay someplace nicer. Very good, very good. Well, let me move us on to my next. You just did it, Sam. I love, I lifted off my uh, space bar to unmute. Forgive me about that. I'm moving on to my next poll question here. And so you should see that. And what I want to do is kind of focus more on the seller side of the market. And then we'll talk about the buyer side of the market as well. Um, and obviously the thing that's unique and different in this market is COVID. And so the question is, how are sellers responding to the market situation we have? And in particular, is COVID affecting them? Are they uh, nervous about that? What, what are they seeing? So let's, let's see that, and I'll jump in and try and get some feedback on what people said. So I see opportunity, excited. results I've got a couple results in here so a little apprehensive that would be my guess what we have there fear opportunity bullish so unrealistic an interesting word opportunity Continue to throw in your words because this is really useful. And what I want to do is, is maybe try and reach out to somebody who uh, 
uh, who hasn't shared with us yet on anything here. Um, Adam, do you want to give us your thoughts and what words you put up here and, and, and what you're seeing from sellers right now? Sure. Uh, you know, right now I think unrealistic is probably a, a really good word. I think sellers, we've been in the seller's market for so long that they're they're starting to kind of forget that it's, it's not everything that I want and I get exactly what I want every single time. And you got buyers uh, that are jaded. You got buyers that are tired of playing the negotiating game. I've got buyers that, that say, look, if there's an offer in, just let me know because I'm not even going to offer. I don't want to get in to playing that game anymore. Um, you've got buyers that are paying at, above, asking price, and then asking even for simple repairs, and sellers are saying, no, we're not going to do it. If you don't, you know, if you don't want to get it, that's fine. We'll just put it back on the market. We have three other people, and it's, you know, it's, be, it's becoming an issue more for for the buyers, I think, than it is for the sellers. But I, I think it's going to come around here in fairly short terms for the sellers um, if if the market doesn't or the economy doesn't start opening back up. I think the sellers are going to start seeing a little bit of an issue. I, I'm already seeing um, a little bit of a slide, I think, in that uh, hot market, that 200 range. Um, yeah, we've still got a lot of buyers. It's, they're still, I mean, it's still moving really fast, but I think it's starting to slow down a little bit. I don't know if that's because school is starting to start, uh, getting ready to start now, and we just kind of pushed off that slowdown from the first part of August to now the end of August, first part of September. Or if that slide is going to continue, but um, yeah, I, I think the the seller just really have an unrealistic uh, idea of, of what's needed from them, not necessarily what's expected, but that they do still have to uh, negotiate it and work with other people. I think that's really where they're at right now. Very good, Stacy. What's your perspective on the sellers right now? I agree with a lot of what Adam said. Um, I guess one thing I, I keep pushing is that it's an opportunity, I said opportunity. I mean, it's an opportunity for someone if they've been thinking about selling their house, it's a great time to do it. I know I have a few sellers who have been on the fence and thinking they might want to move up and this all of a sudden I've got one super excited because she's seen what's being listed in her neighborhood. So I think it's opportunity for those. But I agree with Adam on, I've seen a huge thing with repair requests that um, they're like not going to do even even the simplest of things or the things that should be done. Um, the other thing I've seen huge, which I think is a good thing, I'm seeing less and less as, you know, I'm looking at all the contracts in the office as a broker and I'm seeing less and less and less um, seller paid buyer's costs. And I think for a long time that was really out of whack in a, in a time where it was, I think from when we had our big housing crisis and where it needed to be done, that never bounced back in balance to where buyers were expecting to pay their own costs for a loan that they're getting and a house they're getting. So I have liked, I have liked to see that, that that's kind of died down a little more that buyers are having to take care of what's really their cost to buy a house. And I, and I feel that's been good for the seller too. Very good, that's interesting. So I, I wanna come back to you, Matt, on that because it's a question we often talk about is, is what impact, what, at what point do uh, seller pay points and, and, and seller you know, closing costs for the buyer translate into artificially higher prices? And so if that's minimizing, does that then bear further support for the transaction price as a as a fair indication of market value and i guess if any of the lenders want to jump in on this in their perspectives i would value that as well so matt go ahead well um it would i my experience has not been uh similar to stacy's i guess because i i am still seeing i've got an appraisal up in front of me right now and almost every one of them has seller paid concessions on it still um, so I'm still seeing that have amounts as you've seen in the past. Yes, yes, if they, they've been, if they, you know, three, four thousand dollars, five thousand, uh, well, almost all these transactions. So I'm still seeing it uh, very prevalent. Which again, we discussed in the past is it's just so counterintuitive and what's very much a seller's market that we're still uh, having seller paid concessions 
pretty uh, pretty frequently. Um, yeah, it, it would sure be nice because we still run into a lot of issues where uh, you know everything is already selling at the very upper end of what is would be considered a reasonable range for that property, and then when the sellers have four, five, ten <laughs> offers, uh, you know they're always going to take that highest one out, or the they're going to take that highest one, and if that highest one is inflated with uh, you know four or five thousand dollars in closing costs. It makes uh, it, it certainly makes our job as an appraiser uh, very very difficult because um, we are already kind of strained at the upper end of that range and that's been quite another four or five thousand dollars uh, to cover those closing costs. That's usually the straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, so you know, I I I, I hope Stacy's right and that I start seeing more of that. Um, I haven't seen it yet, uh, but I, I hope she's correct. <laughs> Kevin, have, have you all been seeing any change in that aspect of it for purchase loans? I know you get a lot of things that are refinancing as well. Yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing a lot less um, points being taken as, as the rates are low enough now that the points aren't necessary to get the, the lowest rates now. Um, as far as the seller concession, um, you know, I, I don't have any direct uh, knowledge of if, if that has increased or, or remained stable, but I do know the points being paid are, are less and less. Very good. Messina, anything from uh, Meritrust perspective over there? Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. <laughs> I can never tell. <laughs> um, I, it's been, it has been less um, seller paid costs, and really, you know, when we Previously, when we would issue pre-approvals, we might tell someone, you know, you you don't necessarily have funds to close, but you can most likely ask the seller to pay to talk to your realtor about it, and we're just not even having that conversation anymore. It's just basically, this is what you need. This, you know, you're going to have to show that you have this much money to be able to purchase because seller paints are probably a thing of the past, but I still have seen some come through on contracts. It just depends on the price range. Um, under 100, there might be some in there, you know, on higher end, there might be some, but it, it's definitely been less. Very good. Well, I see another question, another comment up here that I think is interesting. Somebody wrote Cats 22, so I want to know what you, who wrote that and, and what you were thinking about. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Tim. There you go. Yeah, I'm sorry. They wrote uh, Catch-22 because I have some people that put their house on the market, they're going to sell it, but then they couldn't find anything and they were worried they were going to get their house sold and not find a house, so it's kind of a Catch-22. They get their house sold, where are they going to move because they can't find what they're looking for? They're actually taking that off, taking the house back off the market and going to wait until it loosens up a little bit. So it is kind of a Catch-22 for some reason. And that, of course, that hurts our inventory because nobody's putting it on the market because they're waiting. So. It's catch 22. Well, that raises the question that was asked yesterday in the Kevin Sleeper Out Table, which is to what extent are you seeing sellers put forward contracts that have a contingency of being able to find a house? Are you seeing that very frequently? And uh, Adam, you've got your hand raised, so if you've got to answer that question, I'll let you go first. But uh, otherwise, I will come back to you for whatever your question comment was. Go ahead, Adam. Well, I don't necessarily have an answer to that, but I know one of the discussions I've had with my sellers is, um, you know, it's a great time to sell is right. You're, you know, you're doing it at, at the best time, but I've encouraged them actually to look for a rental and sell now, rent for the next six months to a year, let the, let the market kind of settle down and then come back because prices are so inflated that it's getting to the point where, where I'm afraid once the market starts to correct and I, you know, I see that happening towards the end of this year, or first part of next year, kind of coming back to a, a little bit of a correction. A lot of these people that are paying ten or fifty thousand dollars over are going to be upside down on their houses. So I've really been, been encouraging my sellers to sell now while it's at the top, and then find the rental and rent for a year, and then let's look from that point. Anybody seeing contingencies from the sellers about being able to? sell their own. Stacy, go ahead. I'm starting to see that written on 
several contracts that I reviewed that they're they're saying it's subject to them finding something. I'm kind of like, I don't, I'm not necessarily telling them to rent, but I do talk to them about, you know, have a contingency plan of some temporary housing if, you're, if you want to sell and think you're going to, you know, turn around and find something we can close on in 30, 45 days in two days, so. Mm-hmm. Rochelle, you've been very quiet over there, so uh, do you have anything you want to share about sellers and what you're, you're seeing? What work did you put down here for sellers? Of course, working new homes, so we're not mute. I don't agree with what everybody else has said on this one. I, when I look at it, um, I look at it from market trend perspective. Um, you know, if we were in a normal state of, of uh, without COVID, where would we be? I think all of this has caused a disruption in what normal patterns we would normally be seeing. You know, people moving, you know, either up in homes or you know, your retirees moving into a different one out of the larger homes, and I think we've caused a state of just, let's just set, set wait and see what happens. Um, so I think that's a lot of the cause of our low inventory is, is the uncertainty of what's going on in the marketplace right now. So I, like with Stacey, I do see some of the uh, contingencies being there. Um, we've got to find something um, before, you know, we can sell our house uh, because of the, the market right now so that's just kind of my overall feel and i think we've had a total market disruption and it's causing the mindset to be different of our sellers right now very good well patty asked a question uh, about whether rentals are readily available and i think one of the questions is you know are they wanting to rent single family duplex or are they okay with moving into apartments obviously we've had a lot of apartment building anybody have perspective on whether Sellers that are choosing to move out of owner occupied and going to rental occupied, are they having troubles there or is there enough inventory there right now to allow them to do that? Any perspectives? Well, I don't know. They're out there, it's just how much you want to pay. Because I've heard that the rental rates are going up, 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 and you know, sellers aren't excited about moving into one because it's so expensive. Adam, did you start to say something there? Yeah, another seller I have um, that's going into a rental, they'd already negotiated rent even before we had a contract on their house. So they had something that they were able to go into. If they found something, you know, they could buy, but they had a rental. Um, Apartment-wise, there's more than enough apartment space out there uh, is is what I've found. My daughter just went into an apartment, and um, she had... You know, we, we visited multiple different apartments and they all had, you know, openings that were coming up more and more. And I think, I think that's because those are the people that are really getting into, and that's why we have such a, a hot market right now is those renters that have been renting for the last several years are, because of COVID, are wanting to get out and get into a home. And so it, it's kind of a reversal at this point. If you can sell, you should be able to get into an apartment for sure. I think the single family homes are going to be harder. Because I think I think she's right there. The prices are going up on those. Very good, Tim. You had started to raise your hand. Is that something you wanted to share? Well, I'm not. Well, the rental thing. One thing that lack of inventory where sellers can't find a home. It's kind of, it's kind of affecting us. We do some new home developments, and we're finding a lot of people have given up on finding a resale home, and they they're going to go ahead and sell it, and they rent and wait for a new home to be built. So I think it's been a some of a boost to the uh, con- new home builders construction. The problem that we're hearing from builders though is that now they can't find enough labor to keep up with the construction, so their finish times are delayed. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's it's a weird market right now, but I think indirectly it does help the new home market. I don't know, Stacy, you have to. Well, that, that. that's a really nice segue. Gary has raised his hand, and I think wanted to share something. But then I'd like to hear from those of you involved in new home sales and new home construction. We're going to see how all of this is impacting uh, the new home construction market we'll see. So Gary, you, you start us out there. I think the key to a lot of it has to be the interest rates. And we've never seen interest rates like they are today and how long they've stayed at this level. I mean, if you're a first time home buyer, you can buy so much more house than you've ever been able to buy before. It is interesting. We are seeing a number of our investors in the bank are raising rents. Uh, and most of those are, I mean, a lot of apartments, a lot of them are single family, but it seems to be a very active 
rental market too. Uh, and that's interesting to me because I think we've only begun to see the unemployment issues. Uh, what we're seeing is a lot of our customers who are in the manufacturing world have continued to pay their employees because of the PPP fund. Those PPP dollars are running out now and they don't have to hang on to the employees to get those forgiven. And I think we're going to see more and more layoffs for the next 90 days. So uh, again, very interesting market. Well, let me, uh, so uh, remind me, I want to make sure I can come back to that because there's a real question for all of the lenders about what you're seeing in terms of forbearance and whether or not those are loans that you think later are going to perhaps slide into delinquency or whether or not it's just people taking advantage of a program. But I want to finish the stuff on construction first. So let, let, let's keep talking about that construction area. Uh, Nancy, you have your hand raised. Do you want to share something about uh, the new home construction? Go ahead, Nancy. Very good. <laughs> I finally got uh, talked to the, two of my builders yesterday. The biggest thing that we're um, facing right now is the cost of lumber, uh, availability. Um, uh, some of the subcontractors that we have used for numerous years uh, are facing unemployment of uh, people not working, so we can't get them in there. So we're seeing some delays that way. Um, we have people that are wanting to buy and to build. It's just that um, we can't even give a good quote on lumber right now. And so a lot of things. Patrick, you want to respond to that? Yeah, that is that is a pretty significant concern. Um, the first concern is outages. Um, if you can get the lumber, uh, it's you don't know exactly what you're going to pay for it. Uh, the, the quotes that we just are going out with here for September, I can tell you are below our replacement cost right now, which is a scary position to be in. Um, we do everything we can to protect our, our builders and, and provide monthly and, and sometimes longer pricing. But uh, um, September went up 26% from last month, and last month had gone up 19% for the month before that. And when you compare it to the exact same time last year, it's up 80%. So on an entry level house, um, that could be rough math, you know, $8,000, you know, so a lumber package that maybe was $12,000 last year at this time is 20. So that can eat into it quickly. So it's, it is a concern on the resale side. I would think that would help drive some of the appreciation. Uh, but you know, I Cape news had a deal last night it's not just lumber, it's roofing. Um, we have, um, we run out of siding about once every week and a half for a half a day. <laughs> and then we get our next rail car and it quickly goes out. Uh, decking has been very difficult to get a hold of. Um, people through the whole COVID invested in remodeling and stuff. So things like decking and things like that are, it, it's, a, it's a position I don't know that we've ever been in. And uh, my, my hope and prayer is that the, the builders are are definitely um, you know increasing the price of their homes appropriately uh, because uh, I just looked at the the CME lumber futures and it's limited up for the September contract uh, again today and I think it's been that every day this week so it's up twenty nine twenty nine dollars per thousand and it's up to Nine hundred fifteen dollars per thousand. And back in March, it was uh, three hundred. So, um, you know, hopefully the market never has to feel that. But um, right, because I'm going to we cut it off. Second, but but Patrick, I'm I'm curious. Do you have a sense as to why we are having the shortages? Is it is it demand driven? That that just there's so much demand for the product right now. I mean, we have it, had it's most disaster. Or is it supply chain driven? Is it is it shutdowns that have limited the ability of of of, of suppliers to actually put the product out? Uh, unfortunately, it's both. Um, you know, for for the last several years, we've had this Canadian tariff fight back and forth, and so the Canadians haven't been shipping as much lumber into the United States as what they used to. So they've kind of curtailed uh, up until this point the uh, the domestic 
production has uh, has covered that. I've been very happy with it. It was stable. But then when COVID hit, um, there was a, a, an initial pullback, and then some of the mills reported uh, lack of labor uh, because of COVID. Um, and then what happened is everybody, construction was deemed essential, and everything kept cranking. And I think some people maybe thought we were heading for a quick recession, so they curtailed. And so you had a, a, a pinch on the supply, and then the demand has gone crazy. You know, even here in Wichita, I think Waba's last report, I mean, per- permits are up, builders are reporting unbelievable traffic. Um, and so, it's, but it's not just here, it's nationwide. So, um, you know, I, I, I think lumber is a classic supply demand deal. It's, it's one of the purest ones I know of. I, I do think there's going to be a lot of commercial projects that get uh, delayed, and I think that we'll, things will settle down. But um, I was praying it was going to settle down a couple hundred dollars ago uh, per thousand. So uh, it needs to needs to settle down. Said. Well, Mark, you've been very patient there. You you had a comment that, or a question that you wanted to post, so please go ahead. I'll make sure you have my mute, Mark. There you go. Um, my perspective is more from the development demo side, and, and I guess a couple, several thoughts. Um, I think the silver lining with Telebed is that for all of us, new home and resale is that home has never been more important than it has been in 2020, I think. Um, and so that's, that's the good news. New home construction 2020 has been a great year, um, I think. You know, so far demand has been very good. Um, new home in that entry level, and certainly in our in that 200 to 400 thousand price range, has been good. Um, I think COVID has changed some things that we're starting to see. Where office and homes are important, um, the amenities you have in the development are important. The uh, the lifestyle at home. Being like your patio, swimming pool, those type of things. Uh, I've seen more pool being built this summer than I've ever have. And so I see the psychological effect of just from COVID affecting how people live, how they, how they live in their homes. And so I see those things changing. Um, you know, I hear people talk about there's going to be a, a, a correction. And my opinion is, you know, I'm glad to see those prices going above this price because we're starting to see existing homes catch up with new homes. Now, factories news and that, that stuff's happening. Costs are going up again a little bit quicker. The new homes now, and so I was kind of hoping that could balance out and then that, that need that we have would be taken up with new homes. Um, and so I, that there's a gap in there as far as the value of the existing home versus the new home. And it's getting closer, I think. And so uh, I'm hoping those things can catch up and make that difference. And then, and then a big key and is just the interest rates. I mean, it's crazy low interest rates, and it's brought a lot of buyers into the market that they probably wouldn't have if it was uh, a point or two points more. Um, but that's been a real blessing at this point uh, of our timing right now is interest rates. Very good. One of the comments that was made yesterday when I was doing the Kansas City Roundtable is that, that uh, a number of the agents said that they were seeing buyers who were so frustrated with the, you know, going out trying to get a, um, to get a, 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 a you know, they, they missed out on several opportunities in existing homes. They never were thinking about new homes, but they basically decided forget this, I'm going to pay the premium that's necessary and build a new home and, and rent until I can get that or whatever. Are any of you seeing your buyers behaving that way with respect to moving to the new home market? Leslie, uh, Samar, I see you you nodding your head. Do you want to share any thoughts with that? You want me to unmute myself? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have had a couple of sellers that were like some people talked about on the fence and realized that now was such a good time to sell that they decided to sell and rent while they build custom homes. Um, 
they were able to build even even bigger homes than they thought they were going to build because of the interest rates and the fact that they made a lot more on their house. So I have had a lot of people that decided, yeah, I don't want to be in this competitive market with the resale. I'd rather rent for six months and build a new house. So I've got several new builds going right now. Very good. Leslie, I think you were nodding the same way. Any, any experience there you wanted to share? Yeah, we have multiple new builds going as well. Um, and, it, and what's even crazier about them is they're going ahead and starting the new construction side without even selling their houses. So we've seen a lot of sellers going ahead, getting qualified to buy houses, whether it's new construction or uh, pre-existing, and then waiting to put theirs on the market until they get something under contract um, because the contingencies just haven't been as effective. And it, I mean, and we're talking anywhere from you know, 700,000 and below. So we've, we have had multiple new construction jobs going and I think it's because of interest rates and now people aren't wanting to spend as much remodeling and looking at it from an equity standpoint because they're able to invest their money in that higher price point, um, you know, in, into the market and make more than the two and a half, three and a half percent that the interest rates have been. Let's jump into talking a little bit about buyers, and don't worry, Gary, I am going to come back and talk about that mortgage lending, but I've got, <laughs> got some pieces I want to do here. So let me share my screen again, and you can see the question that we have. Uh, the question is how buyers are responding to COVID. So once again, in one or two words, uh, what are you seeing in terms of buyers' response to the current state of the market? Fearless. Aggressive. Urgency, positive advantage, frustrated, ready, urgency is there. So, so uh, first person I saw their, their response there, it was, uh, I mean, fearless was the word. Anybody want to admit to writing fearless? What, what you were thinking when you wrote that? That would have been me. And, and what I'm meaning by that is I'm seeing buyers that are willing to do whatever it takes to get this home. Whether that's qualified with the other home, which was something that was very rare. They're coming in an amazing frequency with being willing to carry two homes if that's what it takes. Repairs, some of the repair items that I'm seeing buyers willing to accept responsibility for um, are drastically different than, you know, years past. Okay. Uh, obviously, a lot of people wrote frustrated. Anybody want to give some experiences or, or anecdotes of, of what your buyers have been saying to you? Nobody's jumping in here, so I'll, I'll call some people out. Dwin, what, what have your buyers been saying? Sorry, I just see his face and then I call out a name. I, I think they're frustrated when they go out, they see a property and, and the multiple offer situation happens and they don't know what to do to get a home that they really do like. I put that they panic and they, they write an offer and then the next day they're like, oh no, I decided I don't want that house. That's what, I mean, I think they're remorseful the next day. Yeah, what's your, what's remor remorseful, your second word as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was going to ask about that word. Yeah, um, I think they panic and they, well, we're going to do the best we can, and they end up getting it, and the next day they're like, oh, yeah, we decided we really don't like that house as much as we thought we did at first. Are they backing out of contracts then? Yeah. Or? Yes. Okay. But are sellers concerned about that, or are they just going to the next one down the list? I think they go on to the next one down the list, but also sellers are kind of being a little bit stinkers about earnest money. Okay. Well, it even is though they get a contract for a reason, but even though they get a contract within another twelve hours, they don't. They don't. They want that that earnest money. Right. Yeah, I've had that happen on that. about four times. Is there, I mean, I've heard realtors in the past say that earnest money deposits don't really mean much, that, that no matter what, it's going to go back. Are you seeing that changing right now? Yeah, there's, 
there are so many disputes over earnest money and sellers who really should give it back won't. Um, it's it's frustrating. Okay. It's extremely more. frustrating. Kathy, you had started to talk. Well, um, it, true. Uh, buyers, if they change their mind, should forfeit their earnest money. So, uh, but, you know, we have been very grateful during this time of all the offers that are coming in. Buyers are really ready for the new house that comes on. And if they're ready, they can get in there. Um, understand we're in a little smaller market. I've seen buyers willing to spread out for their areas more, you know, go to different towns. I never thought I'd be driving to with them um, just for the product, just the particular type of house they want. And, uh, you know, we buyers really feel like they hit the jackpot when they get the offer. And we've had them come back the next day. Did I really just get 5,000 more for a 1,300 square foot home? You know, but they have that time of remorse and then they come back and get there. Um, buyers realize that even though it's a seller's market with 3% interest, it's their market too. So I think that's why this demand is so unreal um, is because it, this market is working well for both. So, and I do have agents really treating contracts with respect and not playing the game of taking offers for three days, making it more complicated. If you get a good offer, take it, you know, if it's good for your seller. And so, um, because we can only sell it once. Thanks for doing this, Stan. Oh, well, yes, happy to do it. Um, you know, this raises one question that, that I've had. It had, you know, this tight inventory is not something that's happened overnight. It's been building up over the past four or five years and just gotten exacerbated with COVID. Um, but I'm curious, one of the things that we've discussed in the past is that even as it's been a seller's market from the statistics, buyers haven't been behaving that way in terms of still being very picky, wanting what they want. If they can't find what they want, they simply pull out as opposed to settling or stretching. Um, and so my question is, are you seeing buyers respond differently now in terms of their willingness to settle? I've heard a little bit about that in terms of accepting repairs that maybe they have in the past, but John, I think I saw you nodding your head. Do you want to give any examples or, or follow up on that about buyers settling or not? Oh, got it on mute. It uh, depends on the price point. Um, we're seeing it in, in various price points, and, and I think uh, a great example we're starting to tell buyers today is that how lucky we are that our market is solid in terms of appreciation rates. We're not, we're not seeing this runaway inflation. Uh, I just got back from Colorado and Frisco, one bedroom, one bath condo just sold for $660,000. Uh, can you imagine 600 square feet at that price? And uh, people need to realize that we're very fortunate in this market. And uh, yeah, we're, uh, the higher the price point, um, we see a lot of cash on the sideline. And we're, uh, we're not, uh, those, those higher price properties are, are going um, with a, a decent amount of appreciation, which is great. Um, lower price point, a little more hassling going back and forth. So uh, it just depends on the market stand. Yeah. Anyone else want to respond to that issue of whether buyers are settling? I'm not seeing anybody jump out, but I am seeing some comments go back and forth on the chat. So let me bring that in. And, and Stacy, I think you started this one about addendums that the seller is having buyers sign that the buyer will pay the difference if the appraisal doesn't come in at value so that they won't cancel it based on the appraisal. Um, and then I see several people saying whether or not you'd suggest your buyers signing that or not. How much of a difference is that making in terms of, of buyers offers being accepted? So if you had two offers, one that had that one that didn't, um, how is that impacting it? Go ahead, Stacy. Um, I think Dwayne started it with her question if, if 
if you're seeing buyers paying the difference and and i started to see those addendums just come in contracts that my my agents are writing and doing um you know as a buyer's agent if i'm working with the buyer i wouldn't want them to sell it as a seller's agent i understand that hey if everyone's you know risking to go above above a you know above purchase price to add if they are adding in their costs and that i get it from the seller side um and I guess I, I usually would instruct the buyer then, you know, you have to know that either you're, you're willing to do it to get the house or you are willing to know that, hey, if I don't get this house, I'm, I'm okay and I'm gonna walk away and find something different. But I get the thing, because I think when this all started, a lot of people were just, um, instructing their buyers well, well we'll offer more and then when you know if it doesn't appraise the appraisal is going to come in and then that's going to be fine you know we'll, it'll all wash out settle down later on and and so i get that if they're inflating it way above how it is protected to the seller but i don't know it's, Joanne, do you want to follow up on that one since you started that thread well i, I have seen that appraisals are because of the escalation clauses that we've got out there right now, where you know we'll pay a thousand dollars up to a certain point more than the highest contract. I know everybody's seen that, and you know it's it's kind of a scary thing for the. But I always tell my seller, don't get married to that price, that, that appraisal price. But there are some buyers out there that are willing to pay the difference or pay more, you know, above the appraisal amount. So. I don't know, how is, how is the appraisers dealing with that for the escalation clause, Matt? Well, I mean, you know, just because they're willing to pay doesn't really have any impact on what we come in with the number. The number is what it is, you know, what it is. Um, one thing I, I would say that we have seen a lot, at least I've seen a lot of, uh, that would scare me a lot if I was a, a buyer signing stuff like that where I'm you know, willing to pay the difference. Um, right now, the one, just anecdotally, the ones that we're coming in low on, uh, you know, I, I always say that, you know, my, my job as an appraiser isn't to say a property is worth X and not Y or not Z. It's to say, is this, a purchase, is, is this number reasonable? And uh, there, we're seeing a lot of instances where, you know, a property, if it's close, we, we get there, the ones we come in low on, it's usually disastrously low. Uh, it's like, this, how, where did this number even come from? I mean, I came in on one I just finished yesterday where I, mean, I worked to get within $20,000 of the contract price. And so I, I, I would be pretty terrified as a potential buyer of signing any kind of escalation or just anything that says, yeah, I'll cover the difference. That difference could be monstrous. So, yeah. well, what happens in, in a year or two years when they try to sell it? They say, you know, I bought this for 150 and you're telling me it's only worth 140 I mean, that's that's where we're kind of... Yeah, and, 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 I, I mean, I, I think I put on one of the earlier questions, uh, this sort of, uh, this increase is unsustainable. Um, I, I worry about the exact same thing that you guys are worried about as well. What happens when this is correct and people try to sell? I mean, we're, we're headed for another downturn. That's the pessimist in me. I say no, it's just a matter of time. Um, but I mean, as an appraiser, you know, it's really not. It, it, it's a, we're, all we're doing is reflecting the market data. People are willing to pay these things, and we've got closed, uh, comparable sales that justify a lot of these numbers. So I mean, that if the data is out there, just because I know everything's inflated doesn't mean I can say, hey, listen, I know. There's columns out there, but we're not going to appraise because this is going to be bad eventually. You know, the effective date on these appraisals, they are what they are, and as of this date, uh, the value's fine. Uh, it may not be tomorrow, and uh, okay. yeah, uh, that, that, that's what's really frightening uh, to me, because, and that's why I asked about the, the unemployment question earlier. Eventually, I would feel like this has to start filtering through. We're going to have to see some sort of um, downturn where people stop spending money like it's just always going to be there um, and then what happens when they say okay now i need to downsize and now i need to move on and i can't because what i just bought this thing for is it isn't uh, isn't worth that anymore so we've had this correction and yeah I, I, i'm terrified for the future <laughs> well 
Well, I think that's where our shortage of inventory is coming in, is that buyers are, you know, they're afraid to lose that house because they won't find another one. And so, but, yeah. Uh, well, I saw Marv raise his hand, and then I saw Tim. So let me get Marv first, and then uh, come back to Tim. So Marv, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I hate for us to think, is it overinflated? Uh, it may or may not be, but I think it's going to be, a lot of base on going to be how our economy goes if it continues to be strong. The inflated rate, I think, is just getting hot up the construction. But once those two meet, we'll be able to be take care of that inventory. So I don't, I always hate to hear what you say. There's going to be a correction. Um, there may not be. Um, and I think it's just that once again, once it gets, gets caught up with new home construction, then things will level out. But there hasn't been that disparity between the two. I think we're just getting closer. Very good, very good. Tim, you had your hand raised and wanted to share something. Oh, you got it on mute, Tim. Sorry, guys. I did. I said, Mark said part of what I was thinking, but my real question was when you're talking about unemployment down the road, I'm, I'm thinking that sometime, you know, they've got the moratorium on evictions and uh, rentals and, no, and uh, mortgage payments. What's going to happen when that moratorium is gone? I'm predicting that we're going to see, and I could be wrong, lenders may be a better picture, but I'm thinking we're going to see a, a rise in foreclosures once this moratorium's on. I think there's some people hanging on and living there, but I'm just curious, that was one of my questions I'm going to have today. What, what do lenders think of, of uh, the potential for an increased foreclosure? And I think that's going to skew the market then because then we're going to have more inventory if it's going to be foreclosure. I just so that's that actually the next question that I would like to Sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's a great transition. Let me get Patrick before we go because he has his hand raised. And then let's talk about that question of mortgage for, uh, uh, forbearance and so forth. So go ahead, Patrick, give us our final thoughts on this one. Yeah, I, it, I agree with Marv that there's been too big of a difference between uh, resale and new construction uh, for the last several years. I know it's been going up, but not as fast as the cost of labor and some of that material. I mean, lumber will come down. In fact, while we've been talking, the futures have gone down. September's still going up. But, um, but there is, I mean, there's things like, you know, the flooring, the, the trade labor around here has, has gone up quite a bit, the roofing, you know, all that stuff, that stuff just tends to go up. I mean, lumber will go up and down, but all the other components of the house, I, I gotta believe, are, are continuing to go up. So it, it's important that the, that the two markets come closer together uh, because that, in essence, is the replacement value of an existing home. And to me, that ought to play into the price of, of the existing home is what is a cost to replace. Very good, very good. Well, uh, Tim asked a great question, and it's something that, that kind of relates back to some, some issues that we had before about how are the mortgage um, forbearance programs, and then what does that look like in terms of will some of those loans that are in forbearance right now translate into delinquencies and foreclosures, and, and is there some sort of artificially hidden problems that are working down the corner. And so I think, Kevin, you were getting ready to start to share on that, uh, but I'd like to hear from all of our lenders in particular to the extent that you can share at all uh, what, what you're seeing in terms of the, the, the prevalence of, of forbearance uh, of, your, of your borrowers and, and where you see that going going forward. So Kevin, go ahead, you can start us on that. Uh, yeah, at, at Capital Center we had two different rounds of, of forbearance, with the first round being a three-month, you know, forbearing payment, uh, second round being an additional three months if, if the borrower elected to to uh, apply for it or, or request it. Uh, we, we saw a decent amount of people jump on the first round of forbearance, and, and uh, I don't know if that was just them being prepared. Um, I suspect it is because because a decent amount of them, although their loan was in forbearance, they continued to make the payment. And we only saw 15% uh, elect to do a second round of forbearance. So um, although we had a, a, a decent initial reaction, it, it didn't seem to follow through. Um, on, on the consumer lending side, in addition to that, 
we've seen quite a bit increase in in borrowing on recreational vehicles, on on vehicles themselves. Uh, so we've seen quite a bit of increase in consumer lending as well. So it seems that people not only are not worried about making the payment, but they're continuing to take on additional debt uh, as well. So as far as the bank side, we we set back a a substantial amount of money for credit loan loss reserves in anticipation that you know the market will correct and and we will have forbearances. We set we set back about uh, you know 20 million, 22 million just for that. So uh, whether that actual loan loss reserve is realized, will will obviously is unknown and, and it'll be interesting to see. But but as far as the consumers right now, um, they did not elect to go under round two of, of forbearance and they're continuing to to add on the debt. Okay, Ernie, what uh, what what have you seen over at CUA? We had a very similar approach to uh, what Kevin was talking about initially, three months forbearance. And, and the vast majority of those individuals that elected to take advantage of that, um, about half of them continued to pay regardless. Uh, the other ones took uh, one or two months and then resumed payments. It seemed like the bulk of them, it was a, a, a cautionary or preventive measure. Um, and. The other half of those were individuals that were impacted initially with a layoff or a furlough. Uh, and then as soon as they went back to work, they just picked up right where they left off. Um, one of the things we're looking at is we really don't anticipate significant problems uh, with foreclosures on that pool of individuals. It, it's the ones that may be coming uh, that concern me. And, and one of the first telltale indicators we're all looking at is what's happening in the credit card space. That'll be the first shoe to drop. What we've noticed there is people have pulled back on credit cards, largely because a lot of them use them for travel and things of that nature, so it's still kind of masked. But um, once we see that delinquency rise, that would be the next step would be uh, bankruptcies. Um, that'll be the leading indicator that, okay, now we're going down the road. Okay, Gary, any thoughts on, on all of that in terms of interest and what you're seeing with your mortgage portfolio? Yeah, I think they're, they're pretty much in line. Uh, we're, uh, as you know, far more focused on the commercial side, but we're doing what every bank in the nation's doing is, is boost our reserves because we feel like there is challenges ahead of us in the, uh, the business side of the world. Uh, I, residential side we just don't have a big enough portfolio stand we sell them so i'm really not seeing a whole lot there but uh okay. consumer lending so far has been just fine but i i agree i, I can't remember who kevin or who mentioned I, I do think consumers are being very careful with credit cards which is uh, unusual so yeah we're pretty good certainly we've seen with some of the uh, stimulus checks and other things a lot of people have used them to pay down debt because they have to make a spend them in the same way that they might have otherwise so we've seen it do you have anything you want to add in terms of uh, lending side and foreclosure for uh, i'm sorry mortgage forbearance um i mean it's pretty much in line with what the guys are saying um we had a lot of money set back for loan loss that we haven't had to use and um as far as seeing people you know, in the refinance world, you know, we're seeing pulling the credit reports and seeing people that are in forbearance. And I, I don't know that I've come across anyone that's actually been using it. Um, if they are using it, they're setting that money to the side and, and you know, just as kind of a reserves in case they do, you know, once the forbearance is over, um, you know, if they do end up getting cut pay or cut hours, you know, they've got some reserve set back. So it seems like people are, are being pretty wise about it for the most part and not not taking too much advantage of it to where it's going to put them in a bad position later on. Very good. Well, let's uh, move in. And I, I do see your question there, Ernie. I want to come back to it, but let me, uh, on the chat, but let me uh, jump into my last kind of question. This is where I try and turn things around and have you do my job for me. And so you should see the poll that's up on my screen right now and should see it about what you think the number of units, so just number of home sales, we'll talk about prices in a minute. Um, do you think that home sales activity 
will be way, way up again next year. Higher, but just a bit. Pretty much flat, about the same. Um, or down just slightly, or way down from where we are this year. And so, where do you see home sales activity? And then uh, as we go through and we get these, I'm really curious then for somebody to respond why you think that, because the reasons behind it are really the most interesting uh, questions that, that I think we can have here. So, um, anybody want to share with uh, thinking that sales will be down next year? Some of you indicated down. Anybody want to share why your reason was for that? I think I've brought up earlier that the you know the PPP loans are coming to an end, and once you already got that PPP loan, you no longer have to keep those employees once you start to pay that back. And I I think we're already seeing it. You're seeing airlines that are um, starting to furlough tens of thousands of employees, and I think that's going to be coming down the pike all the way through as we get closer to the end of the year. You're going to have employers that just have to start letting employees go because it, we're not getting that uh, market back open. It's not so bad necessarily here, but along the coast where restaurants aren't open and stores aren't open, and you know, how long can you, can you keep pushing that off? And I think that's where we're gonna get a hit is those employees towards the end of the year finally lose their job and then have to sell and get out of their houses. So I, I think, I just think it's gonna be down next year I can't I can't see it being able to hold on really strong unless something really changes very good very good uh, so on the flip side it's several of you said higher but just a bit no one's saying way way up uh, what what are your reasons for thinking that home sales will be higher this year anybody want to jump in on that one I think the is going to grow okay uh, in terms of population and in terms of, of, of in migration, or I think people are going to bring their businesses here. Okay. Okay. Leslie, you're nodding a little bit there. Anything you want to follow up with that? Well, I, from everything that I've been reading and talking to other agents around the country, I think that we'll see an influx if if the prices of houses are so inflated in other markets, we're just a very affordable place to be. If people are able to work from home, which we're seeing more and more of, then they're gonna be able to choose where they're working from and it's gonna be more of a family environment and it's gonna be more affordable. So I agree with Cindy and, and I think the Amazon thing is just the tip of the iceberg. Very good. Well, we got some responses for this one. Let's go to the next question, which relates to new home construction. So next year, new home construction in the Wichita area will be A, through the roof, B, modestly stronger, C, about the same as it's been this year, D, down just a bit, or E, don't ask. That, uh, that, that, that phrasing comes from, from when, when the housing crisis came, Chris Goebel always used to call my chart of new home construction as, as the, the ugly, ugly graph. Uh, so that's... So I think we're getting a lot of responses here that are modestly stronger. Anybody want to share your reasonings for being modestly stronger? And anybody want it? Did anybody want to say through the roof but was afraid to say it? So some of the things we said suggested we had very, very strong construction. Go ahead, Patrick. What? I think that the inventory has been coming down so long that the new construction is is uh, in the minds of, of buyers a lot more than maybe it has been the last couple of years. I would say it would actually be through the roof, but I don't think there's enough capacity. Uh, I don't think there's enough developments in the works to, to really get back up to um, imagine if we got back into 1,500 permits. Uh, you know, we averaged 2,500 permits for 10 years. And, so I just don't think we have the infrastructure in place to actually go up too much, but I, I think the the residential new construction is is a great option for buyers, and they're starting to see that. Um, and as long as Cindy's right that our population grows, I think we'll be there. If if uh, Spirit does a hard pivot down, I I uh, would be concerned about that. But um, I, I think 
overall the fundamentals are strong. Good. Anyone else want to share their thoughts about new home construction? We haven't heard a lot from you, Rochelle, so I, I can put you on the spot a little bit. Sure, I, I think it'll be modestly stronger. Um, I think our builders are gaining some confidence again. Uh, I think for quite some time um, after they went through what they went through in 2009 and 10, they were really gun shy, but I think they're getting their confidence back and um, more and more of them are approaching us and say, hey, if you just have some opportunity, call on me because um, I want to expand a little bit. So I, I think we'll go up a little bit and I'm hopeful for that. We need to invest partly. Very good. Cindy, we're sent in a comment saying concerns about contiguous land and whether or not we've got the land needed for development. But Marv, you raised your hand, so give us your feedback on what you see for new home construction this year. Yeah, I, I think we can't forget that it's, you know, it's, it's been good already. It's not like we're, we're, we're down. Uh, and so it's been strong already, and I think, I think it's going to be uh, modestly stronger for next year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, lifestyle that people are wanting are changing and we don't want to get into the new home communities. And, uh, you know, my only concern is pricing. Uh, the supply chain was already to see some effects with lack of the builders being able to get stuff on time. Uh, but hopefully, uh, get through this program and, and uh, it needs to be political, but I think the election is going to be important. Uh, 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 Leslie, you made a comment in the chat about schooling playing a big part in this too. What, what were you thinking of? There, there are a lot of things I can imagine, so explain what you were thinking. You know, we've we've had multiple conversations with people that if school isn't going to start, then, you know, they're going to have to do more of a homeschooling position, then they don't need to go do the urban sprawl. They would rather be closer to work and not you know, out towards Andover or out towards Andale or anything like that. They're, they're fine being in town and closer to their job if they're not going to have to buy a house based on school district. Interesting. Very interesting. And I think most of the development is urban, you know, the, the suburban areas. So kind of goes back to what Cindy's saying. Yep. Yeah. Well, let's go into my last question because I really want to try and get it. We may end up running a few minutes over, and I hope, I hope you all be patient and, and able to stay for a few minutes. I'm really sorry about that. But my last question that I have here is about home prices. So in 2021, Wichita area home prices will rise by more than 5%, rise strong, 2.5% to 5%, rise by less than 2.5%, so slow modest growth, uh, remain flat, no appreciation, but no fault, no decline, or E, home prices will fall in 2021. Uh, some of you may have heard national forecasters who are project projecting nationwide that home prices will fall, and so I'm curious if you feel like those projections have any relevance for Wichita market or not. And it looks like we're getting a pretty strong consensus at, you know, strong, but but moderate home price appreciation. That, that kind of sweet spot that, as I've described it in the past, of say three to four percent is is that really strong, strong, healthy appreciation without being so fast as to kind of create imbalances. A couple of people would rise by more than five percent. Anybody want to? Kind of discuss why you think home prices will rise at that rate. Anybody want to admit to being the person who said uh, rise by more than five percent? You know, I think Patrick mentioned earlier, prices of new homes continues to go up. I think you're going to see an increase in resale price also. Yeah. But I think it will play. There, there's a market there. I, I said it would be rise more than five percent because if you look at your chart and you look at the inventory of existing homes, uh, that was driving the offer greater than the listing price. And then you tag on to the cost of the home construction going up, I think the combination of those will result in a higher uh, rising value. 
Very good. Um, there was at least one person who said rise by less than two and a half percent. That's not really bearish on the market. Um, you know, there's a lot of Wichita history to say that's a, a normal appreciation. Uh, anybody want to say why they're they're uh, think that appreciation will be a little slower than what uh, what others may have thought? The nice thing about these polls is you can be anonymous, but I love it if you're willing to step up and say, hey, here's, here was my rationale. No one's going to admit to it, so that's okay. Well, I wanted to make sure you knew that I will take all of the poll results that we've done. I, it creates a nice little executive summary and a two-page PDF that I will send to Sheila, and then the board office can send them out to everybody who's participated. and. And make available so that way it's an easy way to kind of see the summary of all these pieces um, before we stop i do want to come back to um, the question that ernie posed up in the uh, uh, chat box because i think it's an interesting question which was how um, how heavily are real estate investors influencing the purchase market right now um, so we've talked a lot about home buyers home sellers and kind of implicitly been in the owner occupied market but what are you seeing from investors and how are investors impacting what's going on in, in home sales activity for single family homes right now? Go ahead, Leslie. The investors that I have heavily worked with in the past have been kind of taking a back seat. They feel like the prices are super heavily inflated and they're more interested in watching what's gonna happen in the commercial space since a lot more companies are going virtual um, to see what's going to happen with those empty infrastructures and making decisions based on that or going more multifamily if, um, if there's a lot more layoffs and things of that nature. Okay. Anybody else have perspectives on their investor buyers? I'm not seeing any great anybody jumping up jumping the gun to do that and that probably means hey we're at time and we need to finish things up so i really want to thank all of you as always um you know we are i use this information to kind of help give me some context as i prepare the annual housing forecast uh, we'll be releasing that forecast in conjunction with the kansas association of realtors annual convention this year and so i hope you all can join us for that uh, I also want to give a big shout out to Meritrust Credit Union and Security First Title. Once again, they've agreed to sponsor the printed publication. And so we'll still have those publications available that you can still have. And uh, uh, so we'll work on getting those to make it easy to distribute, to make them available to you and your offices for your listing agreements, for your relocation packets, or however else you want to use them. Uh, Sheila, do you have any last thoughts or Sandy, any last things you wanted to say before we finished everything up today? Um, no, thank you everybody for participating. I think it was some great information and, and some good insight on what everybody is seeing. So. Excellent. Well, as I said, we recorded everything today and I will compile that, make it ready and available, and then I will send it off to the board office to say, how do you want to distribute it or not? And so if you want me to make it public, we can make it public, and I'll put it on the Center for Real Estate website, but if you want to keep it as a private link, uh, a private video, only available to those that you, you want to distribute, um, I, I want to, I'll go on and respect whatever you all want to do with that, so just let me know. And with that, I want to thank you all. I think it's been really helpful and, and really useful. I think we've had a great discussion today. I wish I could be with all of you in person, but uh, until we can, farewell and have, 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 make the most of this fantastic uh, selling opportunity we've got.